Hello and welcome to the 75th episode of the Fundraising Bright Spots podcast. My name's Rob Woods and this is the show for anyone who works in fundraising and who wants ideas and maybe a nudge of inspiration to help you raise more money and enjoy your job, especially during the pandemic. And today we're looking at ways to develop a new product, event or fundraising campaign. And I'm really pleased to be joined by my friend and long-standing collaborator, Craig Linton. Craig is a hugely experienced trainer, fundraiser, consultant and author. You may know him from his fundraising detective blogs or as the co-author of the excellent book, Donors for Life. And he's also the lead trainer on our Individual Giving Mastery Programme, which starts again for the fourth time this autumn. In today's episode, we're excited to share with you a three-step model that Craig and his colleagues at the Supporter Experience Collective have found to be a really effective way to stay organised and maximise your creativity as you gather insight and develop ideas for any new fundraising initiative. And to bring the model to life, Craig touches on a recent project at the Natural History Museum in the UK, which contributed to a really successful virtual event which, among other things, raised double its target for individual donations. So without more ado, here's my conversation with Craig. Hello, Craig Linton. How are you? Very well, thanks, Rob. Thank you for inviting me on to the the podcast again. You are very welcome. We got some lovely feedback from the earlier episode. And uh, today we are going to look at, in particular, developing ideas and uh, an approach to testing ideas and gathering insight in a really organised way so that you not only minimise risk, but also you learn and you increase the potential upside because you're more likely to get your fundraising project or appeal right or mostly right first time. Just before we get into that, I guess my question would be, Quite often, organisations don't quite get round to being organised in gathering insight. They know they should, but there's reasons why it doesn't quite happen. Um, is that your observation? And what would you say to an organisation? They, they've got an appeal coming up or some kind of new fundraising project coming up, and they don't quite know how to get started in gathering insight in an organised way. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Rob, that a lot of charities and, and fundraisers struggle with this. And I think part of it is you hear the word insight and that can feel quite scary and it can feel quite overwhelming. You think, well, I'm going to have to speak to the data team or I'm going to have to get lots of information from our CRM system or I need to go and get some budget. But actually, a lot of what we'll talk about today is that how do you do this in an efficient, low cost, but effective way that charities of all size, fundraisers in all organisations can use to quickly gather the information and to check out those hunches that we have, that intuition that we often have for ideas, can you find information to test that quickly and efficiently rather than spending lots of time, lots of money, um, lots of meetings to try and figure out what you're doing by using this process, hopefully you will take you step by step through a way that you can robustly test in the real world your ideas and your theories about fundraising and developing products and event ideas or individual giving campaigns, uh, whatever it could be. Yes, that makes sense, Craig. And I gather that you've developed a a model uh, and you and your colleagues at the Supporter Experience Collective have found it's really been helping some charities that you work with. Uh, I know there was a large cancer organisation that found it really helpful uh, and a museum recently, uh, it helped them to get some wonderful results. In fact, that was intriguing, the the one you mentioned to me before about a a museum and how it helped with a virtual project they did. What was that result? And then after that, maybe we can just introduce this model uh, because I think it will help our listeners. Yeah, certainly, Rob. So about this time last year, we worked with the Natural History Museum on a virtual event they were were planning this big in-person event of course because of covid they had to turn it into a virtual event and it was a a concert with a fantastic uh band and um author of the lost words that was set to music it was incredible very beautiful and well worth a listen but back to the fundraising they they were help we want we need to get an audience to this virtual event we've never done this and we used what we call our get stuff done model to work through, well, who is the audience for this? What are the different messages that might work for, for those audiences? 
how can we test it quickly and efficiently online? And we used mainly Facebook ads for that. And then once we found out what was working, we rolled that out. Um, and, you know, I'm very pleased to say we got over a thousand uh, new donors. We had, I think, three or four thousand people attending the concert itself. The target was to try and raise 50,000 from individuals. And we raised over 100,000 using this model um, to help us identify our audience and cover what they needed, explore and prioritize our thinking ideas, and then engage and test and prototype those ideas before rolling it out. Well, Craig, that sounds like a, a fantastic result. Well done to all concerned. Uh, top line then to help our listeners who may not be able to work with you one-to-one, what, do, what does the model look like? What are the main stages in that top line? And then after that, maybe we can go step by step. Yes, certainly, Rob. So we start with the uncovering phase. And this phase is key because it helps us understand what our supporters want and need. And it helps get the team, the project team who are working on this uh, a new idea or this new campaign to understand what those needs are. Because I think one of the traps we fall into, we want to jump straight into the ideas and we want to start doing it. But what we're saying is actually before you get into the ideas, get to know your audience, understand what they need. And then we go into the explore phase, which is where we can start thinking about those insights and come up with problem statements to spark ideas. And then looking at where we want to prioritize our time to look at those ideas that we think have got the most potential. And then finally, when we go into the engage phase, this is all about taking the top ideas into the world, create a really simple prototype, get instant feedback from supporters and colleagues, and then we evaluate that and iterate from there and improve it until it's ready to be a fully formed, right, we're confident this is going to work, let's launch it and, and put it out there. Now, like all models, you can't, it's not necessarily linear and you might have to go back a stage and forward a stage, but we find it's really useful to help think in this way to to take you through a a process that will get you to a tested idea. So we help you take that idea and turn it into reality Mm. in hopefully quite a short uh, period of time. Yeah, that makes sense. And one thing already I'm getting from that explanation is it's um, uh, destroying the myth that when there is a successful project, it was because of one great idea, one eureka moment. So I love that your model is already just showing this. There's a process to follow, do the work, rather than think it's about one moment of genius. But if we could come back to your first chunk then, and I think you called it the uncover phase. Already one thing I'm sensing is, the first step is, is even not say, what is your outcome? What result do you want? You need to do some insight gathering first because that might affect you deciding what what exactly the problem is or the outcome is. It, have I got that right? And, and what are the, the two main ways you split out that uncover phase? Yeah. So I think where we begin with, Rob, is think about what insights do we need so we can understand the wider context, you know, and identify the gaps and opportunities, making sure that our supporters are interested in this and then understand what some of the emotions are around why people support you and why they might want to get involved with this uh, project. And then some real world observations. So we're looking to generate insight from our internal data, from external data, you know, might do that classic pest analysis or YouGov data is very helpful in understanding it. You know, one tip that I love and, and tell lots of people about is the Facebook ads library which is completely free. You can go on and look at what other charities are doing in terms of advertising. And you can start to see, well, if if Charity A is running this advert four or five times a year, it's probably a good hint that that's working. So is there anything you can learn from that, adapt from that um, and take from it? So one of the examples um, from Eleanor, who's part of the collective when she worked at CRUK, they, they were doing a project in their shops And they wanted to test an idea around increasing donations from uh, younger female shoppers, quite style conscious, and they thought thinking about how they could do it. And one of the first things that they did was going 
out into the shops and observing how people interacted with the shops, how they donated it, you know, that uncovered that this group that we're targeting, they were, you know, time poor. They didn't have time necessarily to sort the stuff out and go to, to the local shop, even though they were quite willing to because, you know, they might have given in memory of a grandparent who, who died or, or anything. So that just meant that they needed to understand, well, we have to make this easy to donate. And so that insight w- would then lead them on to um, the next phase. You can use surveys. You know, I'm a big fan of individual interviews, just talking and rather than talking, mainly listening to supporters, understanding what they're looking for, why they support, and they can cover a real wealth of information from quite a small number of interviews. Um, And then the final thing in terms of gathering the insight is, it sounds quite a fancy, complicated word, this ethnography, but it's really just about observing people in their own environment. So if you've got a retail shop, go and just sit and watch what people do. My colleague Leanne, when she was doing a a project at Christian Aid around tap collection boxes, so cashless and contactless. She went in to the tube station where she noticed a charity had one of these. She just sat with a coffee for an hour observing who went up to the poster, who tapped on it. what, And, and that gave her some really interesting insights to then take back for when they were thinking, how do we make more of this opportunity within, within our um, uh, charity? So there's lots and lots of ways you can gather insight and none of those necessarily involve big, expensive, strategic, external agencies. Um, you can do lots of this yourself. And actually, it's really good fun, the, the, the insights part of it. So once, once we've generated the insights, it's all about then framing the problem um, and making the most of the data. So we often use personas personas can get a very bad press and when they're not done well and correctly they can be more of a hindrance than a help but when we're de- talking about developing personas it's it's very much around what do they link to what we call empathy map so it's about actually what they support themselves as saying they're doing they're thinking they're feeling how do you uncover that how do you help use those that mapping to to paint a picture of your supporters of what their needs are, where are the gaps in your research, and can you cluster ideas and observations, and, and are there different groups of supporters? So going back to that concert we talked about, you know, it was very quickly, there was people who loved the museum, there was people who loved the, the band and the authors who were involved. There was also then... Um, people who were very environmentally conscious because it was raising money for an environmental project. And then even within the museum audience, there was people who were members without kids and people with kids. And you can see there four very distinct groups, all needing slightly different messaging. And the empathy mapping just really helped us understand what those needs were. So we could then hypothesize about, well, what's going to appeal to them? What benefits of this concert are going to really appeal and, and, and make people want to sign up and, and, and do something. So just to be clear, Craig, a, a picture of how it worked in, in that situation, um, you worked to, well, you discovered that broadly there were these four types, di- different types of, of a segment of the audience, roughly, uh, but then you tried to make those each of those four as human as possible in terms of why they cared and what their habits and, and, and beliefs and so on so were, and you got that down on paper, but crucially it was based on insight from desk research, but also may, maybe interviews as well. And once you had those four really clearly, probably going on to the next stage in the model, it became easier to make decisions about is one of these more important than the other, or can we satisfy all four, but in different ways? That later tactical stuff became easier because you could see what, quote the targets were yeah absolutely rob and it's it's then you know come back we'll talk about prioritize later but it helps you understand well you know what's the size of that audience you know how close are they to and connected are they to your cause how easy is it to reach them 
you know, what are the, the habits? So you can then start prioritizing, well, actually, the easiest group is the museum, but actually that's the smallest group as well. So actually the, the potential there is probably smaller than the, maybe the music group, but they might be harder to reach because they were in North America and, um, you know, across Europe. It, it was a balancing act, but they all had very different needs. And the personas are all about gathering and the empathy mapping is about un- putting yourself in their shoes and understanding what they want. You might have heard this one before, Rob, but supposedly Einstein once said, you know, if he had an hour to solve a problem and his life depended on it, he'd use the first 55 minutes to formulate the right question. And he said, you know, once I've got the right question, I can solve the problem in less than five minutes. So one of the big switches that we recommend, we touched on it earlier about, we sometimes dive straight into the idea generation is, well, actually, what is the question that you're trying to, to solve? And a really simple way to do this is a technique called the five whys. Um, you probably used it, you know, it just really simple. You just keep asking why until you get to the root cause. So really simple example, a fundraising team might want to solve their low supporter retention rate. So you might start, well, you know, 90% of our supporters don't make a second gift. Why? Well, we don't inspire them to give again. Why? Actually, our thanking and welcome journeys are generic and boring. Why? Well, we talk about ourselves rather than about our supporters' needs. Why? Oh, we don't know enough about our supporters. Ah, so the problem shifts from how do we improve our retention rate to, okay, well, how do we capture more data on our supporters' motivations, beliefs, and identities? And it helps you then answer that problem. So back to this, you know, the... Eleanor's example at CRUK. So our shops aren't attracting high enough value stock. So our shops aren't easy to access for people who might donate high value clothes. Why? Shops aren't located close to them. Why? Oh, our target audience lives in more affluent areas. They're working during the day and weekends are already busy. So they don't have time to drop things off. Ah, okay. So our problem isn't necessarily the stock. It's how do we make it easy and painless to donate high value stock to, to CRUK. So you can use those five whys as a really great technique to, to get to actually what are we trying to solve here with it? And not just raise more money, it's about, well, why do we want to raise more money and how is it good this going to help us and, and so on. And the other one is about using this idea of how might we to reframe your challenge and to, to look for solutions and the choice of how and might and we is deliberate because how sort of suggests, well, we don't know the answer yet. So we're putting aside our preconceptions and we can explore a range of solutions. Might suggest that there's more than one way to do this. So it allows us to go multiple directions. And then we is about collaboration and using the collective knowledge of your colleagues and volunteers and, and other people in the organisation to get the best answer. And you might create multiple how might we statements. So for the Natural History Museum, you know, when we talked about how might we, well, how might we get people to the, to the concert? How might we inspire people who are interested in the env- my environment to give? How might we incentivize the music people to, to sign up early? How might we involve children? So you can see by answering those questions, you just start then getting ready for that generating ideas phase which which comes next in the model hi there it's rob and i wanted to jump in really quickly in case you'd like to get a deeper level of training and coaching support than is possible in these short podcast episodes and if you work in individual giving i'm excited to let you know that this autumn craig and i are again launching the individual giving mastery program which is designed to give you the strategies and the support to help you grow ig results for your charity This is the second time we'll be running the programme since the pandemic began. And last time we were incredibly proud of the results that people achieved, including, for instance, the brilliant Jax Jones, who used the techniques to achieve her charity's biggest ever appeal total, raising a quarter of a million pounds for her hospice. If you'd like to find out more about Individual Giving Mastery or any of our other programmes, go to brightspotfundraising.co.uk forward slash services. For now, though, let's get back to the interview as Craig explains the second phase of the model. 
so now we're going to explore, Rob, we're going to explore some of those solutions to the problem. And the first thing is around ideation. Um, you know, we want to get people away from those those dominant people with quite fixed ideas. And we, you know, we want to try, how do we help bring in fresh thinking and ways of doing things? So really want to try and do it in a structured way, you know, brainstorming in some ways has a bad reputation. So we, we, we look for some other brainstorming techniques to help us avoid that group think and to, 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 to generate a wide range of ideas to the problems and the how might we statements we've identified. So lots of tools and techniques here. We use something called SCAMPER, which is an acronym that stands for substitute, combine, adapt, modify, put to another use, eliminate, reverse. And you sort of challenge people to think, well, how could we swap something or how can we combine something? So, you know, again, thinking of that example in the CRUK and, and the attracting, you know, how might we attract young aspirational shoppers? The scamper, well, substitute, what can we replace? Well, can we sell our high value stock on eBay? Could we do fashion shows in our charity shops would combine? Can we create advertising campaigns specifically aimed at young shoppers? Can we donate via post rather than dropping clothes off at the charity shop? So is there ways that you can solve it by using these different frameworks to do it? Getting back to the National History Museum, so we had our different groups that we'd found through our research. We'd developed uh, empathy maps. We'd come up with our how might we statements and our problems. So now it was all about generating those ideas. What could our Facebook ads look like? What offers could we do? And we then developed ideas where we could, you know, we could offer them behind the scenes tour. We could offer them bonus footage. We can offer them a, a gift pack to for, for Christmas, we could make them a VIP, we can send them artwork. And so so we, we had lots of these ideas that we generated that we then looked at, well, how can we prioritise and what is feasible with the infrastructure and the teams that we had? So we, we thought we came up with a great idea about uh, a fun pack that we could do for, for schools and for children. But actually, just the logistics of getting it approved by the different departments in time just meant it wasn't going to be feasible. So we just had to park that one. And actually what was feasible was repurposing some content and actually packaging it together with um, a behind the scenes interview with one of the, the, the authors and one of the musicians. And actually that, then when we put that in the final stage, which we'll, we'll get onto, became really well. So prioritizing those ideas, once you've got those 10, 20, 30, 40 ideas that you've generated and ways you can do it, start prioritizing based on whatever criteria you've set for your um, challenge. You know, look back to the problem. What do you want to achieve? Try and base it on facts, not on the loudest person in the room. And, and make sure that you're giving everybody a chance to share their views. So you might do that through scoring. You, we often use uh, dot voting and giving people um, post it, you know, ways to, to be able to say, that's my favorite. You might use something like an ease and impact matrix to see, well, actually, we're just not going to, this is just too complicated. It's going to take too much time. We can't do that. But actually this one over here, we don't need a lot of input. We don't need a lot of things, but actually we think it's got a lot of potential. So we'll, we'll go for that one as well. So that then gets you to the point where, right, we've got our priorities. We're now going to go off and, and, and test them in the real world. And we're going to go to the final phase of the model. Yeah, so Craig, we've got this uncover stage and this explore stage. We're really making progress now, uh, and, and you really need to start turning it into something. Uh, how do you frame that last chunk? Yeah, so this last bit is around starting to prototype and, and test those ideas and then obviously evaluating them, have they worked? So prototyping, again, it sounds quite technical, but, but all we're saying is just test this in a small way. Don't don't wait until it's absolutely perfect. You don't have to, you know, spend again thousands on designing something or getting it ready. This is about rough and ready testing to, to help you get to the next stage and to see, okay, does this idea um, have legs? So there's, there's lots of uh, ways you can do this. Um, just a couple, there's something called an appetite test. Um, lots of um, online companies do this. So, 
um, they might set up a fake web page or landing page, do some either you know Instagram ads or Facebook ads. Can they get people to the to the fake landing page, signing up? Is there enough interest in their idea? Um, and if it is, yes, well, okay, we're onto something. We'll we'll do it um, in the future. Prototyping, where you might physically make something, you know, you might sketch something out, or you might um, ask and then get a potential support to take a look at it. You might design a poster for an event or something. You know, what do you think this is about? Would you do this? What would make you sign up to this? So you just make people easier for them to to get an, a sense of what you're ask, going to ask them to do. Um, and then the third one, which I, I really love the name of, which is the Wizard of Oz test, because this is basically, um, if you remember the Wizard of Oz, you know, re big reveal, and actually it's all a um, sham behind the scenes. It's not actually um, automated and the rest of it. So this is the idea of doing something in the background that appears automated, but it's actually a manual process. So in the... Um, CRUK example, what they did is they got people to mail in their clothes and they offered to pay people for them. Now, ideally, that would have all been automated and, and they would have you know done it automatically. But in what they in reality did to test it was they got the clothes in, they had to run down to the local shop. How much is this worth? How much is that worth? Calculate it out themselves manually and then you know send the check off in the post back to the supporter. But by doing it that way, they could see the potential flaws and what worked well in the idea and um, where we um, where they could improve it. Um, the other one we used, uh, obviously, a lot and very cost effective for testing is, is Facebook ads. So testing different audiences, testing different offers, different ways of responding. So, you know, a bit like that appetite test, set up a landing page, find out more about our upcoming events. Um, and then you can very easily say, go back to people, thanks for getting in touch. Actually, there wasn't enough interest this time, but we'll we'll let you know if we do do anything in the future. So we, again, we looked at a few different ideas and products, quickly tested them, found out that this behind the scenes thing was, was working really nicely for the music audience, finding out that this gift idea was working really well for the family audience. And then we could then put some more money behind it and, and take it forward. So just really think about what's the smallest, quickest, cheapest, easiest way you can test something to learn from it. So just start the first piece of the jigsaw. Just do that, you know, rather than spending, you know, lots of time and money on it. And then use the real observed behavior. Not Don't ask people afterwards, but, you know, how do they interact? How do they actually do and use the thing? Um and watch them doing it and using it if you can and write things down. Yes, Craig, that's really helpful. And when you're talking about this uh, step of prototyping and testing over the years, both in charity sector and commercial sector, I've, I've seen various examples that, that I, I really like and I see how they helped. I do agree. It's a thing that just doesn't get done enough and a tiny bit of extra courage or creativity can really help you get momentum for it for a whole project to move forward. My favorite example recently, I, I was reading a book called That Will Never Work by Mark Randolph, who uh, I don't know if listeners are aware, but he's the co-founder of Netflix. And many years ago, uh, when he was trying to work out what his new business idea could be and how he could make it work, and he was playing around with the idea of creating a mail order industry or creating a mail order business for DVDs where people could could rent a DVD, but through the post. And there was a point where it just didn't add up because of the cost of posting DVDs and so on. And the key moment at which his business idea became possible was when he decided to just, as soon as they'd had the idea, they got a DVD and they put it in a Jiffy bag and they posted it to an address in a different state. And it arrived, A, there cheaply enough. B, it was small enough to get through the post boxes. And C, crucially, it didn't break on, it, on the way. And because of that test of those three crucial things, suddenly the numbers for how he, he could have a really successful, profitable business, cr you know, creating a new business category, really, it took off with the confidence that he wouldn't have had had he not just immediately got on and done the, the prototype test. 
Is there anything else you want to say for a listener weighing up about that step? Uh, or if not, is, is there a final piece to this overall model you've got? Yeah, I think the, the importance of prototyping and testing is not just doing the prototype and, and, and test it. It's also then evaluating it in a in a real concrete way and not just rushing to conclusions and saying that didn't work or that did work. It's, it's looking for the nuance in the figures and, and in the criteria that you set. So, for example, with the going back to the CRUK example, so they ran a number of tests and it looked like it was working really well, you know, People were interested in selling the clothes to them. They found the right audience. Uh, they were getting good quality secondhand clothes. But it was only at the final stage when they reviewed, well, actually, if we did scale this up, how much would it cost us and what would be the margin? It wasn't the cost of postage was going to be so excessive that actually it was never going to raise enough money to be cost effective. So they then parked it but took some of the, innovation and some of the other ideas and applied it elsewhere so they could have spent tens if not hundreds of thousands thinking they've got this great idea but by having some very clear success criteria and evaluated against it they could see that we were three quarters of the way there but it just did, it failed on on this final part of cost effectiveness and so they they saved a lot of time and effort and but also got some really good learnings and it was same with the um natural history museum you know we did these facebook ads to these different audiences we've identified you know at first glance if you looked at like cost per click the audience there was one audience that was a lot cheaper but actually when you delve further and you looked in the conversion data and how many of them actually went on to donate the ones that cost a little bit more to acquire and get that interest to begin with actually converted at three or four times the rate and therefore they were the most cost effective audience to target not the one that you would might have just done if you just casually looked at the numbers and not dug a little bit deeper and I, I see this with a lot of clients you can look at the headline figure and jump to a conclusion that or oh, they're the best that one or this is this is what's done but sometimes you need to evaluate over a a period of time so another example with a client is one that they do a lot of petitions and they get people to sign petitions on facebook and then they take them on this hopefully engaging inspiring journey and, and turn them into donors so there was audience a that was signing the petition that got really angry and really like we've got to do this is terrible we're going to do it and thousands signed up and it cost them pennies to get the people to sign this this audience but actually none of them actually went on to donate. So it was great to get that awareness and that thing, but actually they weren't really helping them achieve their mission longer term by donating. There was actually a smaller audience that was a bit older and, and, and slightly different in terms of their demographics and their interests and beliefs that would cost about five, ten times more to actually reach and to, to get people to sign the petition. But they converted it you know, seven, eight times the rate of this other group. And so actually their lifetime value and the um, end result was far better for this other group that if you just look at how much it cost to sign the petition, it would have failed. It was only when you evaluated a couple of months later that the true value and the, the winner sort of emerged. So don't don't throw the, the baby out with the bathwater and take time to evaluate. Allow that into your plan to, to make sure that you are getting the full picture and not just relying on a, a couple of headline figures. So once you've done this part of the evaluation, it's not just saying, oh, that didn't work, let's go. It's also evaluating, well, were the parts that did work? Should we reflect back on that? Is there things we could adapt for future projects or other projects? You know, if it passes, is it enough to just launch now straight and roll out or do you need to do some more testing? Um, and then what insight would help you in the future to do, do an even better job? And... You know, you see this a lot in fundraising, I think, you know, the without naming names, but, you know, there was a real trend. Um, well, actually, Mindful Monsters at Scott was this huge success for a subscription product, did brilliantly well, got thousands of people to sign up. And so everybody suddenly wanted, oh, let's get a subscription product. You know, let's copy the success of Mindful Monsters. Let's do that. And actually, because they weren't properly evaluated or prototyped and tested, I know of at least three or four of these products that have just completely flopped and didn't work because they didn't do that same level of 
probably research and evaluation and testing that that obviously the the team behind Mindful Monsters clearly did. And so they dived in and spent a lot of money rather than taking this more step-by-step approach that would have allowed them to to learn where there was a a demand for their their product in the first place. So think about, you know, think about your budget for testing. Think about how you can use the, the insight and the knowledge across your teams and colleagues and get their buy-in and, and, and making sure you've got clear criteria for evaluating your, your new product campaign idea. Mm. One thing that comes across really strongly is if you're organised and see it in a, an ongoing way, a holistic way, a step-by-step way, it really counteracts this instinct that it might be part of the human condition to want a, a get-rich-quick scheme <laughs> To, to want to see things in black and white, to want one single answer that applies always and forever in all contexts. Whereas in reality, life just isn't like that and neither is fundraising. And I think probably our listeners sort of understand that to be true. Um, and yet maybe seeking ways to quite deliberately put that process in to counteract those instincts, even if not from them, maybe from within other forces within their organisation what that wants a quick answer that's simple and clear and and goes in one simple soundbite on a on a presentation to the board. Yeah, they, they do happen these eureka moments, these big breakthroughs. But you know, the vast majority of new ideas, new campaign, you know, they come from somewhere and you build upon a small success until it suddenly becomes, you know, an overnight success. I think there's a famous comedian, you know, said, you know, it took me 20 years to become an overnight success. Well, you know, we don't want to be 20 years in our testing, but actually by doing this, following this process, we can give ourselves a much better chance of finding ideas and campaigns that that, that work and actually are scalable and, and deliverable. Thank you, Craig, for sharing with us one of the models you teach on the Individual Giving Mastery Programme. I know there's plenty more where that came from. I look forward to catching up with you very soon for another chat about fundraising. But for now, thanks very much for coming on the podcast. Thanks, Rob. Pleasure as always. Well, I hope you found Craig's examples and advice were helpful. If you did, it would be amazing if you could share it on with your colleagues and on social media so that we can get this content out to help as many charities as possible in this difficult year. Thank you very much for your help. As always, you can get a full transcript, a summary of the episode and more resources on the podcast section of our website, which is brightspotfundraising.co.uk. And if you're interested in improving your skills and confidence in individual giving, in major donor fundraising or in corporate partnerships, then I can tell you that at the time of recording, there are still a few places available for each of these training programmes starting this autumn. So do check out the information on our website today. To find out more about any of these or the other ways we help fundraisers learn and stay inspired, go to brightspotfundraising.co.uk forward slash services. Craig and I would love to hear what you think about today's episode. We're both on LinkedIn and on Twitter, Craig is at FRDetective and I am at Woods underscore Rob. Finally, please do remember to subscribe to the podcast today so that you never miss an episode. And thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to sharing more Bright Spot examples and ideas with you very soon. Mm-hmm.